हेलो प्रीज लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन Our gentleman is about to enter, so let's get seated. Obviously, this is not a press conference. It's one with a difference. This is a creme de la creme of Ghanaian media here to engage on the GTP. It doesn't mean that you won't report yourselves. I hope you will report the encounter as it deserves to be reported. So, this evening, Mr. Chamatin is already here. Obviously, you could see us going up and down, and he's on his way up. We are going to have a program that is based on questions. He will speak very little, and then we will take five questions per 20 minutes for four 20-minute blocks. That is 20 questions, which is quite a lot. And so, if you have your copy of the GTP in a brown envelope, and hopefully other envelopes, look at the GTP. Find your question, if you don't have your question already. I can see some foreheads uh, trying to... <laughs> Whose forehead should I mention? <laughs> I can see some foreheads working on their questions. So, welcome. We will have the opening prayer and then we'll take off from there. He's just walking. You will, you will not be restricted from recording the proceedings if you have to, in order to inform yourself later on. Okay, so Mr. Alan John Kwejo Chematin is here. Yeah. With Mrs. Christabel Chematin. So, I'll call on Pastor Ben to give us the opening prayer. Can we be upstanding for a word of prayer? Father, we thank you. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Every good and perfect gift coming from above. Lord, this is a perfect gathering and we know it is not the will of man, but it is a revelation from above. Therefore, we say, many are the plans in the heart of a man, but it is only your counsel that prevails. We declare in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, let your counsel prevail in this gathering by the power of the Holy Spirit. For Lord, by flesh can no man prevail. We declare, let the flesh give way and let the spirit be expressed. Solomon said, I ask that you give me wisdom and knowledge that I may be able to judge 
these great people that you have given unto me for my father David. Lord, many have come to rule this our country, but we believe it is the time of your set man, Alan Chiramatin. Just as you granted unto Solomon wisdom and knowledge and understanding to manage the people of Israel, we ask for same wisdom in a greater proportion, even this time round, for your man servant, Alan Chiramantin, that whatever that comes out of him will not be the expression of man's will, but it will be the will of heaven. Give him understanding. Let him not speak by his own mind. Let him speak just as Peter said, that thou art Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you except my father in heaven. Let heaven speak through him and let the light of God come into this nation. In Jesus' name, collectively we agree to say amen. amen. As we set off on this journey with God, it's a national journey. It's a national assignment. We have an election to win. And we want somebody who can lead this country effectively to win. Tonight, Mr. Chamatin is here to pitch his ideas for transforming this country into a winning country to you. That is why we are here. So as I said before, I want you to engage him. Find out what difference he will make to transform your life so you become a winner. That's why we are here tonight. So, Alan Chamatin is the presidential candidate for the 2024 general elections in Ghana. And he's not in this alone. He is founder and leader of the Movement for Change. But now, he is in partnership, and that partnership is the Alliance for Revolutionary Change, ARC. And Alliance leaders are here. I will swiftly introduce them so that you know that they are all part of this process. We have Mr. Ampofu. Mr. Ampofu is on this side. Give him a hand. We have Reverend Steve Ayensu. Stephen Ayensu. My uncle Odike. Akwesiade Odike. Augustina Kuju. Dr. Michael Abusakara Foster, one of the longest names in Ghanaian politics. <laughs> Alaji Bala Mekankai. <laughs> Mr. Kofi Benibengo. Uh, they, they, they are trying to hide. Today I will introduce them. They are part of the campaign. Mr. Victor Chermatin. Let them see your face. <laughs> And Mr. Alex Chermatin, they are completely and deeply involved in the campaign at the highest possible level. And we also have the incoming First Lady, our Lady Patricia Chermatin. She's a lawyer, for those of you who don't know. Yes. So... So, Mr. Chiamatin, with this array of political figures, individuals, entities, is in the running to be president of Ghana. And he has served in this country. He served Anado as Minister of Trade and Industry, resigned in January 2023 after six years, and is now focused on his presidential ambition. He's also served in the same capacity under President Kufo. So he holds the distinction of the longest serving trade minister in our current democracy. 11 years of being president. Ah, is that not impressive enough for a club? <laughs> Mr. Martin has an extensive and distinguished record in international trade, public policy, enterprise development, politics, diplomacy, and law. He was a senior trade policy advisor for the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, 
He was also the regional director for UNDP's flagship program for enterprise development in Africa, which you all hear us talk about. That's Enterprise Africa, which established enterprise support programs in 13 African countries, including the wonderful initiative in South Africa. Recently, we've been talking about it, that of the seven experts, international experts, who Mandela called upon to help restructure the South African economy in order for black empowerment to take place, included Mr. Alan Chemating, 1994. <laughs> seven experts worldwide, Mr. Chemating was included. So today, if you see South African industry, galloping across the continent. Mr. Chemating is part of it. He later went back alone to establish Enterprise South Africa out of the seven. Then, as Minister for Trade and Industry in this country, he led the implementation of the Industrial Transformation Agenda. And most of you who associate that with 1D, uh, 1F, and the strategic anchor industries, including the automobile industry, as well as the special economic zone in Kumasi, the new Tema, the Tema in Kumasi that's being established at Ejizu. If you have any doubt about 1D1F, ask him. He is also the leading architect of the African continental free trade area the single most important groundbreaking effort by an African statesman in recent times. <laughs> the last time Africa did anything for itself was in 1963, and it was driven by a Ghanaian. Uh, I don't want to go into the battle of the apostrophes, so I won't mention whether the S is after. Uh, the F or the S is before the F. The important thing is that Dr. Kwame Nkrumah persuaded Africa to set up a political organization. He couldn't quite reach union, so he had the organization of uh, uh, African unity, OAU, which has since been converted into AU. Since then, the only thing that has impacted Africa on a continental scale beyond politics is after economics and the European Union has taught us that economics comes before politics so Mr. Chiamatin is the one who is going to transform Africa for the benefit of Ghana <laughs> economically that is where the game is um, he's been a major consultant worked in MDPI uh, UAC uh, he was a manager in UAC at age 22 and of course you should know that he's an economist and a lawyer. Uh, he's done all the things that scholars like him do, uh, scholarships abroad and otherwise. But what I want to conclude with is the recognition of his talent and capacity. Again, all the way back in 1994. Do you remember Y2K? Who here remembers Y2K? You remember? The fear when the world was afraid that the world was going to stop because all computers were programmed to end 1999 and we're going to enter 2000. So Time Magazine of America decided to explore and see who in the world will help in case we tr crossed the line to transform the world. 100 people were selected. Time Magazine is a powerful magazine of international repute. It's, it's man of the year, man of the times, always waited for. And that year, in 1994, they were presaging what will happen in 2000, in case the world was lucky enough to cross, because everybody thought the world was going to crash, why 2K? They selected 100 people. Of that 100, Bill Gates was included. At that time, he wasn't the Bill Gates you know today. He was fledgling, but they saw his potential. You've heard of Condoleezza Rice, who became the Secretary of State. You know Jeffrey Sachs, who is the leading development economist in the world. In that list was Alan John Kwejo Chemating. <laughs> so tonight, I have the distinguished honor of presenting to you the author of the Great Transformational Plan. 
the man who dreams public policy, the man who uses policy to transform. He doesn't borrow to make policy. You don't, as he always says, to transform Ghana, you don't need to borrow from the IMF or the World Bank. You don't need to borrow money to do policy. All you need is a pencil and paper and men at work and women at work. I can see uh, 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 my sister Jan, when I said men at work, uh, it's men and women at work. <laughs> so, on that note, <laughs> the man of policy, Alan John Kwejo Shemati. Thank you very much, Yao, for your very kind introduction. Comrades, leaders of the Afro-Pranto Alliance, otherwise referred to as the Alliance for Revolutionary Change, my colleague, leadership of the Movement for Change and members for the Movement for Change, Friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply honored to have this privilege of hosting such a distinguished gathering of la creme de la creme in our media space, and I'm deeply grateful. Throughout the length and breadth of our country, the people of our beloved country are crying for change. And they are crying for change for eight reasons. First, they want our country to move beyond the monopoly of the duopoly. To move beyond the monopoly of the duopoly of the NDC and MPP. For the fact that these two parties, after 32 years in power, have failed our nation and have been unable to transform our country. After 32 years, we are still in an economic crisis. We have had to go to the IMF for the 17th time. We are unable to keep our lights on. We are unable to have water flowing through our pipes. We are unable to feed ourselves. We are unable to provide basic housing for the underprivileged in our society. Can there therefore be a justification for these two parties to want to continue in government? Is there a real justification? After 32 years, and we are still struggling with our currency, with very high inflation, with all the macroeconomic indicators that point to the fact that we are an economy in distress. What further testimony do we need as Ghanaians to establish the fact that these two dominant parties of our time have failed to deliver substantive progress to our nation. I'm the first to admit that in some sectors, we've had some progress. But overall, the balance sheet does not look good. And as men and women, distinguished men and women of the media, as the fourth estate of the realm, it is your responsibility to shape public opinion about demanding substance from those who want to lead this country. We have a responsibility to go beyond the sensationalism and the slogans and require of those who want to lead substance. So, 
it is clear that people of this country are looking for change. They are looking for an alternative. The NPP has demonstrated that they cannot do their job. Unfortunately, the NDC is not a viable alternative. And that is why you should put your faith and trust in the Alliance for Revolutionary Change, the movement, of change, movement for Change, which I have the honor and privilege of leading. <laughs> Secondly, Ghanaians want us to end the polarization in our society. A divided nation cannot stand. How is it that every single issue now in our country is politicized? It doesn't make sense. How long do we want this to continue? And so when people talk about change, it's not just a question of wanting to go beyond the duopoly. It's also about ending the polarization and the division in our country. And that is why you need an independent candidate who can stand in the middle and stop them from fighting and bring sanity into our country. We've been tolerating for this for too long. And you need an honest broker who is coming to power not to secure the interests of political parties, but to secure the interests of Ghana. That's the kind of leader that we need now. <laughs> the third reason why Ghanaians are asking for change is that they want an end to the winner takes all syndrome. Ghana is endowed with talent. But because of the winner takes all syndrome, as soon as one party wins power, every political appointment has to be occupied by a card-bearing member or a sympathizer of the governing party. So what is going on now? If you are looking for NDC to come, it's going to be the same thing. La Mem shows. But does it make sense that we must exclude all the talent we have in this country because you are not a politician? It doesn't make sense. Let us mobilize the totality of our human resource and put them to work and Ghana will rise again. The fourth reason why Ghanaians are calling for change is that they want inclusive governance. Inclusive governance. When the labor unions move onto the streets, when the teachers are also on the streets, when the nurses are crying, it's because they are not part of what goes on in policy formulation. Now politics is dominated by politicians. But if you go into the matured economies, they make use of the entirety of the country, all the stakeholders, civil society, think tanks, academia, the business community, the professionals, the farmers, that is what you call inclusive government. And that is what representative governance is about. Ghanaians are asking for a government by the people, for the people and of the people. That is what Ghanaians are asking for. <laughs> the fifth reason why Ghanaians are looking for change is the lack of continuity in governance. It doesn't matter the quality of the projects that an incumbent government introduced. It doesn't matter. As soon as they go out of power, the succeeding government has to make sure that they truncate all those projects and start new ones. In fact, that is one of the basis for corruption. Because it doesn't matter whether 
the road that is already under construction is a good one or not. Somebody has to start a new contract so that they can also have a piece of the cake. It doesn't make sense. Right down from President Kuma's time, all the great projects that were introduced by our first president, incidentally, there must not be any argument about the pride of place of Kwame Nkrumah in our history. There should be no debate, no argument about that. So there's no continuity in government projects. And Ghanaians want to see a change in this direction. They are also asking for our country to go beyond manifestos, from sound bites and from slogans. We deserve the leaders that we get. You talk about the great transformational plan, they say it's too complicated. They want statements. Somebody talks about a statement. And that, is that policy? You vote him into power because of a statement. And he comes into power and he's unable to deliver. And now you are up in arms against him. When you are voting for statements and sound bites, have we come to this level in this country with all the great minds that we have, that we don't, we are not interested in substance, we just say something. I'm not going to do that. If that is going to cost me the presidency, hey, we are going to deal with substance going forward in this country. <laughs> That's, that is how the, the matured economies of this, can, of, of this world are where they are because of substance. You are going to stabilize the city. How are you going to do it? How? How? And you just make a statement. <coughs> I'm going to give uh, mobile phones one city. Pay. Is that a policy? Twenty-four hour economy. That everybody uh, there will be an opportunity to work twenty-four hours. Anyway, Ghanaians are saying that they want the substance behind these things. They want the substance behind these statements. Ghanaians are also worried that we've had a constitution for how many years now? Since 1992. And we are still living with this constitution. Again, it has to change. These reforms must come into being because it's part of the reason why we are not transforming because of the lack of these constitutional reforms. And typical of us as Ghanaians, you appoint a commission, they go around the country, they prepare a nice document. There's a white paper on it and as the guys will say, Kebashi, nothing has happened. Alan Chamartin, as president, will make sure that the reforms are implemented. <laughs> and the last but not the least, I'm saying last but not the least, because it is not the icing on the cake. In actual fact, it is the foundation. It's the need for behavioral and mindset change. There's nothing that is going to happen in this country to improve our lives without mindset change. The negativity, the pull him down attitude, the NATO attitude, no talk, action only, the lack of respect for rule of law, lack of discipline. Those are not the values an attitude and behaviors that can put you into the League of Nations. As the Americans you say, it ain't gonna happen. You have to change your attitude. And this is a, a clarion call, um, a call to action for all Ghanaians. If it rains, nobody goes to work. 
A program is supposed to start at five o'clock and people are walking in, you know, like this by uh, at six o'clock. So Ghanaians want change. And that is the reason why the movement of change and the alliance for change, alliance for revolutionary change, Afrofrato Alliance has been brought into being. Yeah. And if the Afrofrato Alliance is saying that we have to move beyond sensationalism to substance, then we must, to demo we must demonstrate that for the people to believe in us and to vote for us uh, into power. And that's why we are here, to discuss the great transformational plan. Incidentally, the branding of this plan in itself is pregnant with meaning. And you must give me the opportunity to deliver the pregnancy in December 2024. <laughs> if you search through artificial intelligence, the, the phrase great transformational plan points to only one person, Alan Chamartin. <laughs> and the three words are significant, great, transformational, and a plan. And it is a plan that is going to move Ghana from our current state of instability to stability, to growth, to resilience, and then finally to prosperity. So it scopes for you where you are now, where you go to the next stage, incrementally to the point where there's prosperity and become a first part of the, the League of Nations. And so please, I recommend this plan, this great transformational plan to you. And I'm speaking to you as brothers and sisters, friends of the media, that you are the ones who can make Ghanaians pay attention to this plan. I know how powerful you are. You can, you can construct and destruct. You can construct and destruct. Now the destruction is too much. Start constructing with the power that you have. <laughs> and that's why I'm recommending the great terms of I've called you here tonight not to come and then read the document to you, something that you have authored yourself with the support of your friends who are experts. You know it back to back. But like the Bible, the new Bible for Ghana, Everything is here. What you need to make Ghana the place that we all aspire to be in three years is all here. All you need is to give Alan the chance and you will deliver on this. So I deliberately made sure that in inviting our friends from the media, I said, read because it's also an, an opportunity to get you to read. Read the GTP, because we sent it to you. Read the GTP and come and interrogate the GTP. I'm ready for you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Wabing, I think you do as required. I hand it over to you. I'm sure they are eager to ask questions and then I'll respond. They will definitely ask questions. Uh, Mr. Incoming President, if you may. Yes, I, I'll, I'll vacate where I am. <laughs> you are in the firing line. Don't worry. <laughs> so, we'll take the questions in blocks of five, and then he'll respond. So, this mic is available, and then we'll provide a mic on the other side for those who want to come in. So my first set of five. Any comments? We are ready. Any comments after him? And then, yeah. On that side, I have three on this side. 
Yes, they will. I have three on that side. And there's one here. So we have five. Good. So when you step forward, before you ask your question, you reintroduce yourself, you tell us the media house to which you belong, and then you ask your question. Please, try and stay within as much as possible a minute. 60 seconds is a very long time. So try. Otherwise, we won't get a lot of questions being asked. So the clock is ticking. One minute. Thank you very much, Mr. Alan Shamatin. My name is Mark Jerry, as I am the morning show host of New FM, Despite Media. I'm taking you to the way to the page 37 of your great transformational plan. I was a member of Kwewu Tourism um, Initiative in the year between the year 2013 and 2016. We did a lot of work in Kwewu Enclave. You've indicated categorically that you're going to provide support to private sector groups and organizations that promote and facilitate tourism. So I want to find out what exactly the provisions that you've made available for these groups. Because tourism, within Kwau Enclave alone, if I'm not exaggerating, tourism can provide us uh, one third, I think, uh, one third of the resources that we may need to develop this nation. So I want to find out what exactly are the provisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to move this forward a bit so we can all see the questioning in a transparent manner. <laughs> okay, I'll do my best to be transparent. Okay, so my name is Kwame Jumo. I work with Class FM. So on page 56 of the documents, if you don't mind, I read. Yes. Establish a mortgage financing institution under a PPP arrangement to promote public housing. Now, this is my question. Salary levels in this country is very low. I'm a young man. I don't know of any facility I can get for anything less than $30,000. As at this morning's rate, that is 460000 I don't have 460000 sitting in my account at the bank. You say you're going to do a PPP. How would you do this? Thank you. Third question. Mpamucho, good evening. Mekechi, why? Pacha from Yatiti, Onia TV, Onia FM, Media General. Me wa page um, 43, ewo um, GT Pidumu. Me pacha me hu corruption. Se o pese wu kunsi ya keta se she. Um, I, 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 no. Oso be amende ye constitution, no. Na wo de anti-corruption za aba. Me pacha wa zun sunia be ne de any special prosecutor, because o se... And no never be replaced. He announced that every she special prosecutor na nae. Ye nyaya ni mse se OSP osu because a buy no dene buy no an kaza kura o man e kwa mani ye juma. Ti me pa cho o di ano sun sun ye be ne um o ba man e kwa mani ye juma because keta se se ne di ninety percent of your problem no e no na ye the cause pa cho u ye manua no a kanichi e das. My name is Samson Ladi. I host News File. My name is Samson Ladi. I host News File. The first time I read the Great Transformational Plan, my summary of it was that it was the coalition of the things that Ghanaians have demanded for a very long time, including the promises of transforming the constitution, the various parts. So this document for me represents listening to the people. My, 
My question revolves around your promise to amend Article 78. You will need sufficient numbers in Parliament in case you won. First, to be able to engineer it and subsequently for the purposes of a referendum. How are you going to be successful with that? Because that is going to be a major challenge for a group like yours. You can't appoint your ministers but the majority from parliament. That dovetails into a part of the question here. How many MPs, candidates, are you nurturing around so that if you got sufficient votes, you will get sufficient members of parliament to help you in the final event? I'm a believer of a third force, and I believe that your movement can take us there. I have voted for Dr. Park Indum and voted for Zenato Rawlings. I have voted for Bridget Jubonuku and voted for Esla Ousu Ekofu. I stand for the Ghanaian who believes that we need to encourage people like you to change the narrative. Frankly, frankly, but for the fact that Samson believes in the new government, I wouldn't have let him ask two questions. <laughs> Patrick was a countryman Songo. Host of Fire for Fire, Doom TV, Fireman. Okay. Uh, Exodus. Movement of Jar people. <laughs> Sad it here. It's about Exodus. Okay, all right. Me will have for sports. Just ended Olympics. Medal back to You got it. Your football. Ningina a kofum. Yes, Paul San Casey, a coffin. Okay. Send me show book in one. What I can see, infrastructure, how well you may see I de uh I um make us a inter schools and I say grassroots and development. Fantastic. In all this, say sports no, yes, sports the a book, a because football three matches grassroots 17 qualify as we are world cup 20 in Timing qualify as we are World Cup. 23 under 23 say Olympic Games 20 years now a member of football and qualify. What do I say? Ah, uh, uh, Barcelona 92 Spain, yeah, Jay Bronze. You see, it's me question in here. The development of sports is heavily dependent on the personnel chosen to head the ministry. Nipa will be the ministry then. Obra will bring in a your president. Nipa will be in our be the sports ministry in any man. And no, any the main problem. More fire, more fire. So now, so now, what kind of person are you looking up? So open to me. Yeah, I, I understand. I will, I, will, I will help the sports ministry. Don't worry. In a professional way. I'm the fireman. I need to also be holding me fire. No? You understand? My building, my brand, 
I was saying, you the fire for fire animal yepa. I'm the fireman. I will always keep them on their toes in a professional way. But when your personality will beat me, a D, yes, boss, in any a changing normal. And yeah, dear, yes, boss, in the beat me a picture. And sports, no, it beat me a boy, the youth. And they Ghana here because I know Ghana is all about sports and politics. More fire. I, I, I'll be making some appointments uh, to my government uh, today. <laughs> so please, uh, make sure that you, you are at your best when you ask questions. First question is in respect of the support for the tourism sector. And it's very instructive. And first, let me thank all of you for pleasing my heart by making references to specific pages and to proposals that have been made. It's, it's a lot of work that you've done by getting into the details and I'm really, really uh, honored by this. So more grace to your elders. That's the kind of transition that I was looking for. And I'm so honored that the media seems to be showing the way forward. So tourism, page 37. And that's in respect of support for the private sector. I want to read it again. I've realized that my main contenders have started their game again, a game of deceit. And it's all about government government. Well, you don't even have the money. Right now, you have imposed on Ghana a domestic debt exchange, which is siphoning money from pensioners. You have not been able to convince your external creditors how you are going to pay them. And you started making promises about government doing this, giving this free, and things like that. So if you read this, it's about incentivizing the private sector to do what government always wants to do. So that is why on page 37 that our friend referred to, I want to read it for the avoidance of doubt. It says that incentivize the private sector actors to do A, B, C, D. But in particular, a friend was interested in finding out what kind of support or what kind of incentives was going to be provided. Finance, it is key. If government is now going to support not just public sector agencies that are promoting tourism, like Tourism Development Authority, like the ministry, but is now going to extend support to those who are in the private sector trying to promote tourism. That in itself is a very significant development or intervention. So number one is finance. We all know that if government can provide incentives and deliver instruments that will allow banks to provide concessionary lending to those in the private sector supporting tourism. That in itself is a major breakthrough. And it is not difficult. In the United States, in the mature economy, that's what they do. All government needs to do is to provide a guarantee fund. Because the reason why <clears throat> banks will not support a private sector company in tourism is because they are not sure about the risk profile of the project. But if government provides a loan guarantee, which until there's a default, it is not a cost to government. So once you provide a guarantee, it will release the liquidity from the banks. And you provide additional incentives, including 
corporate tax reduction to those who are supporting invest, uh, uh, banks that will support tourism. You don't need to borrow to do anything. Just use the leverage of policy. It's as easy as that. And so it's finance. It's also technical assistance. Because if you want to develop Ghana into a first class tourism destination, which is part of what this GTP aspires to, and become the tourism hub for West Africa, then we, we have to ensure that we have the skills at the highest level of performance compared to any service anywhere in the world. That requires not just money, but technical assistance. You need to be able to bring in experts who have the expertise to train them at the cost of government. It goes beyond that. You also need to support these private sector operators, including tour operators, to be able to travel abroad to key tourist sites and destinations to see what it, the competition is like. If you have never been anywhere outside Ghana, there's no benchmark for you. But if government is able to support you, show you around the world, then when you come back, at least you have a sense of what the competition is like. So it's finance, it's technical assistance, and then it is also helping you through exchanges to find out what is happening in the world. And obviously, because we are supporting the private sector, it's not just government dictating that this is what you need. So it will also be based on the needs of the private sector. Once government is ready to support you, you identify your needs, and government can then respond to those needs. So that's how we would support private sector actors in tourism. Number two is public housing. And I'm very happy that you picked on this. And this is page, page 56. Now, unless we have a dedicated mortgage financing company in this country, there is no chance for any young person ever to own a home. But the truth of the matter is that our brothers and sisters who are outside this country, when they tell you that they have a house, you know, it's a mortgage, 30 year mortgage. Nobody pulls down fiscal cash like we do. And like the Soto said, everybody wants to start a house and you build, you can never complete it, you complete it in 10 years. It doesn't make any sense. It's just the policy. The government supports the establishment, not government establishing it, but providing incentives for private sector operators to establish mortgage financing uh, companies. In Ghana, 30-year loans, as long as you have a paycheck, that's all you need, as long as you have a paycheck. And this is specifically designed also to support affordable housing. So if you want to go and live in the plushest area in Accra, obviously, this is not for you. <laughs> this is not for you. You have to find your own money if you want to live in the plushest areas. But for affordable, particularly for our young people, and I can guarantee you that under an Alam presidency, you are guaranteed a paycheck because you get a job. Once you get a job, you have a house within one year. Because the mortgage financing company will make sure that once you have a paycheck, that's what mortgage financing is about. And right now, we are debating whether our pension funds, state funds, should be used to run hotels as against supporting a mortgage financing operation, which would then will deliver hope to young people. So that is the nature of the mortgage financing scheme that we are talking about. Many of us, and I will cry more fast. Omiya, 
anti corruption. Was him in Kachi, to read Miss Remo. Was him in Kachi. Problem here, what with corruption in this country? You know? If we, baby, baby, one, we need a leadership of personal integrity. That's where it starts from. Personal integrity. I've said it, I repeat it. I've never been corrupt. I'm not corrupt now, and I'll never be corrupt. So if you hang around me, if you hang around me and you think that you are helping me to get into power so that you repeat what has been happening for the last 32 years, it ain't going to happen under my watch. I want you to be very clear about that. If you are dreaming about how Afafanto uh, is going to win and now how you are going to build an airport, you are going to build, a, then you are, in the wrong, you, are in the wrong, you are on the wrong train. And that's where it starts from. And it's not just, hey, where do you say? Where do you say? Now say, where do you say? What do you say? Now, the American is say, and yet, so we say, me and in the pet bam and one unquano, I'll make sure they are not corrupt. It's very important. And so, so, yeah, unquana, a bit me, ama, yet me, ama, a catastrophe, and you proeno, yes, yeah, no. They are tossing you, no, I am ra, ah, a yadi, a mine, yes, see, a woha, yadi, attack corruption. They say, who share the rules and laws in our statutes, they say, are intended to fight corruption. The result is, what is the definition of corruption, Grandpa? There's no clarity about it. A definition of corruption which focuses on the fact, he said, using the color of your office for personal gain. Now, I know that there is a connection now, as I say, a no no two would be boa obi, ama or no no et me ya corrupter. Nice, I would encounter. Because it is not directly pinned against you. Anti chronism, for example, is it, is it a nuance of corruption? Uh, Influence paddling. I can't want an account. Nepotism. I can't want an account. It is a say, it's not a quiet Apart from the personal integrity of our leaders, you know, the laws, you know, the mrai woho no so so no, I say, you futu mukakra. I tell me, I say, 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 usha, yoko, I say, omo, a corruption cases. OSP, so I have corruption cases. Uh, CID, so I have corruption cases. Shiraj, so I have corruption cases. And when I in the bet my boss say, OSP say, media, I say, my Christian, there's no case of corruption. Yoko, and I say, almost say there's corruption. Edru Yoko, so I was the media, I was the media, Edru Shiraj, Shiraj, so I was the media. Total confusion. And see, the Amir GT Pino can say, we will now distill all the corruption and corruption related provisions. And I've often heard also. She said, Usha Emra Ewa Ghana says here, including the Constitution, because there are provisions that are constitutional, and also so, and also here they are attacking corruption. And so, I hear you, man, thank you, and I'm a boy. And she says, say, no, Sam Rana make us say. And maybe I say, woman, almost say a deal with corruption. Ye be in a pie, na fe, ya can't boom me a yer back Under one enabling legislation, I yet define corruption extensively to cover not just Sebi, Sir Ose, young whom Philly Philly say, what could you, and I say, well, 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 there's a case of corruption against you. But some of my can you know, influence pregnant, nepotism, chronism, I just say, no, no, I don't know. I bet I'm running. Said a bear, they say, I also say, oh, Papa, and I wouldn't be a bear, and 
It ain't gonna happen. It is Anna, say, say, no. I quite say, me say, you be can you know, boom, not yanya one law or legislation. Now, say, one law and legislation, dear, and your penina, you did, sir, too many bashan in Sano. Say, on dealing with corruption cases, no. Na a fe a senior or golo, a senior mocano, or golo. Na I make a ho ho, I just or no, no, or can't a final. I make a ho ho of corruption, no. A fe on only anti corruption za. Na who share a my own two point, or much more dealing with corruption, you know, or moving our dear friend anti corruption za. Or no can't a final. Now, dear Ed, they will move crap on the side. Say, special prosecutor, and now some young mobile. Or born home wedding, now so so. Power of the special prosecutor is a delegated power and authority from the attorney general. And then I say, who are power and so so, frankly, no. I say, and your power, dear. I was a consul in our country. And she, we say, no, under the new. Constitutional reforms now make them. There's going to be a single, a, a, a second chamber, a second chamber of parliament. Ah, for appointments like this, you know, the president has no business appointing uh, uh, anti corruption chief. Ah, or no appointing, I don't know what to me. We have some of it, me, Akwaka. Want me, Ka. And we have to limit the power of the president, even in making appointments. To the leadership of independent constitutional bodies. That's why we are independent under the constitution. President appoint you are. Wait, my friend, and you pass it. Massa, I did our idea. Met you out to wait me. Won't you mean? And we must remove that power from the president. May I see the president that is on the master tea? A church and the power is in your freedom. Now, we'll be appointing her. Which will be the case of the anti corruption czar, so that he's under no influence. Attorney General require of a crowd with for uh, corruption, so that the prosecutorial, the prosecutorial authority of the anti corruption czar or overlord is not derived from that of the Attorney General. When you have a Dana, no president, I said, America, I can Something like you there, you don't want to, I know. Eh? But I'm beginning to make appointments, though. Eh? Something is putting a foot in there. Eh? Yes, all inclusive. I know he's an independently minded person. Whatever he has to tell you, he has to tell you. So that's the kind of people you need in a government of national unity, which is the anchor of, 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 of uh, the movement for change, the government of national unity. So something be ready. Anyway, so now he is talking about the fact that when we indicate in the GTP, particularly on is it page 78? Article 78. On ap appointment of ministers. He wants to know, because this is a constitutional provision which is entrenched. So if you want to change it, it requires you going through a very extensive, including a referendum. Now, what GTP is saying is that, number one, it will be the subject of this constitutional reform. The constitutional reform will make sure that we remove that limitation of the president that requires him to appoint half of his cabinet from parliament. Of what purpose is it? That, even, sir, that particular provision in our laws even reduces the substance of our checks and balances as a country. Because if half of your ministers are in parliament, 
Then can parliament be truly an oversight body? They can't. You don't even have the time to do two things. Serving as a member of the executive and also doing your work. as All these things, we are aware of them. Why is it that we have allowed it to persist? But obviously, you have to come into power before you have the capacity to undertake the reforms. So what is going to happen? All that this GTP is saying is that, yes, we we'll abide by the Constitution until it is changed. But it only means that the ministers will be appointed, the half of the ministers will be appointed from those in parliament, from those who are independent candidates. He made a very important inquiry as to whether we are interested in promoting some independent candidates. Yes, we are. And we are targeting about 30 uh, members of parliament, 30 members of parliament. Now, and I know that there are, there are parliamentarians, existing parliamentarians and new ones to come in both the NDC and PP who are just waiting for Alan to become president and then they will be more than willing to, to join the, of the government because it's the government of national unity. At that point, yes, you are there on the ticket of the NPP or the NDC. But now, because of your own record and of your own capacity, you will serve in a government of national unity. What a joy. Eh? What a joy that you are singled out now to become a member of the government of national unity, although you went to parliament. So it will come from the independence. In it will come from party parliamentarians who are selected not on the basis of their parties, but on the basis of their own merit. So that's how it's going to be. And people are making a big fuss out of this. Nipano, Nipano, Kakofa, Ghana, in Ghana, that a president invites you as a member of parliament to serve in this government. You will leave the party and then come and join the government. There are many people in parliament, they are there because it will enable them and elevate them, hopefully, to become uh, members of the executive. So I'm even making things easy. You will see what is going to happen in this country. A government of national unity. Half of them would even be more than willing. Because there you are serving Ghana, not your parties. That is the, uh, the way uh, it will be. Then the last one is uh, uh, Mr. Fireman. I wanted to, and I'm in Kano Sutri and I fire. I've seen the minister, my wood running. So, but I think it's very important. What the GTP is saying is that government has the wrong approach, has the wrong business model with sports. If government thinks that they can use government budget to develop sports, it ain't going to happen. That is why if you read through the sports section, it's all about government empowering the private sector to establish sports academies and sports infrastructure and facilities of the highest standard. If a private person is investing, you make sure that he does it very well and you maintain them. And he knows that you're also going to benefit from them. If you don't have world-class infrastructure in sports, you can't develop world-class sportsmen. I think this is, it goes without saying. It's because if you don't have the right infrastructure, it requires the power from the almighty God and his grace to be able to pull somebody through Olympics. But if you have the right facilities, even average performing talent can excel because of the Recently, when we built this swimming facility, you can see that gradually we are now in a position to nurse talents in. So, Farman, it is all about government supporting the private sector to invest in world-class sports facilities. This whole notion of government wanting to do everything when you don't have the money, it, it amazes me. 
That is why we are talking about an enterprise economy. An enterprise economy is an economy driven by the private sector and by businesses. It's the economy that will create jobs and put money into people's pockets. That is what an enterprise economy is. Get the private sector to be at the center of development. They know where to find the money. Even with sports, you'll be amazed. If Alan becomes president with this policy on sports, you see what will happen. It's the same thing I did with the automobile industry. When I started talking about Ghana producing cars, people thought that this was too utopian. But just with their policy, with just my mind, pen, somebody mentioned the pencil, what? Pen, pen and paper. We have been able to attract within one and a half years. We didn't borrow. We've been able to attract five out of the six top global companies that are manufacturing cars in the world. Volkswagen, Toyota, Nissan, Hyundai, Kia. It's never happened anywhere in the world. A developing country where you have five out of the six leading automobile companies competing, not just with one brand. Volkswagen has about five brands. Uh, Kia has about five or four. Hyundai is the same thing. So this has become the real battleground for vehicles. And the beauty of this is that the assembly is only a small part of it. The real deal is in the manufacturing of components and spare parts. And that is going to also start under Alan Chamartin presidency. <laughs> so the next, next round. Taking the next round, I have two from this side already, and then I have, I saw those two, and we'll, I'll come to you in the third round. Yes, there, there, there. We'll start from here. Ms. Okansi. Come forward. The rules on transparency still stand. <laughs> All right, good evening. Uh, my name is Alfred Okansi. I work with TV3 and uh, 3FM, or with Media General. Yes. So, <laughs> on the back of the question that my colleague asked from Onea FM, the asset declaration law, as we have it now, is weak. On many fronts, and many aspects. And I see in, in this GTP that on page 43, VII, you say you would strengthen disclosure as one of the ways of improving on the asset declaration regime. But then again, there are many, including some colleagues of mine in this room, who believe that the conduct of public officers' bill, which is currently before cabinet, and there's really no clear commitment to pass it into law. If in fact, IMF has made it a conditionality as we speak. That is going to solve the problem of this state capture that we're talking about and then the corruption among public sector officers or employees or government appointees for that matter. Would you ensure the passage of this conduct of public officers bill if voted into power and also would you publicly declare your assets so we know the number of houses you own, the number of cars you own before coming into power, and ensure that your appointees also do the same? Thank you. My name is Nanaya for Danso from Onyo FM, morning show host, Yen Senpa. Mine has to do with the economy. I see that is one of your prioritized areas. It's the number one in the book. It said that you chaired cabinet's economic committee. In fact, you tabled a lot of these taxes that in this book you want to abolish or reduce. If that is the case, why should we trust you knowing that you'll be able to do something about our current situation? And we are in IMF as we speak. 
IMF is asking us to recruit, get a lot of money into our coffers by abolishing some of these nuisance tax. Where would you be able to get the money? So we keep it in Bank of Ghana. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bella Mundi. I host the morning show on TV3, so I work with Media General. Thank you for this opportunity. I hope I'll be allowed to ask two questions. In fact, three, but <laughs> we'll see. One. So, okay, two in one, kind of. Okay, so first one, I want to go straight to page 24, boosting local production and productivity. And I says, review the implementation framework of the One District, One Factory Initiative and provide additional financial resources for its operationalization. I want to zoom in on one particular issue that's been trending for many years, and that is the Commander Sugar Factory, which has been trending quite recently, also because of the recent announcement by the Trade Minister that we've signed a new agreement for 15 years, and we're supposed to make one million um, every year for the next 15 years. It might be renewed or not. Now, I remember that that was also one of the major issues that she tried to tackle, knowing that we had borrowed about $35 million um, in 2013 just to refurbish the structure. You signed a deal with Agrotech, Park Agrotech, hoping that we could also get it running so we can start processing our sugar. That didn't happen. And now we're told this is happening as well. I know the deal you signed was supposed to make us 3.3 million US dollars annually. So if you calculate, at least that would have made up for the 35 million US dollars that we had borrowed just to set it up and we could have paid back. Now we're told we're going to be making a million every year for 15 years. Clearly, we're not going to be able to raise that fund to pay back that money and that falls on citizens. I want to understand if you say review uh, the implementation framework of 1D1F, with this factory in particular and the deal that has been signed, does your review mean cancellation or what exactly are you going to do about it? And then, two in one, last one. So I just want to go straight to page 43, where you talk about reducing the size of government. And I realized that you listed a number of the ministries um, that you're hoping to set up under your government. I did not see Ministry of Information. I want to ask, is there a particular reason that was not included, especially knowing that you also want to work closely with the media? Thank you. I'll come back for a youth question later. Thank you. My name is Bismarck Brown. I work with Happy FM. I host Epanwada Beng. Chief, you have extensively spoken about SMEs on page 29 of the GTP. You, while you were Minister for Trade and Industry, you supervised the establishment of about 67 business resource centers. I would first of all want you to explain the concept of the BRCs and tell me how you feel today hearing that the franchise holders are being threatened with abrogation of their franchise under the new minister. I would want to hear how you feel about this. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Thank you for your time. My name is Annie. Okay, thank you. So, I'm Annie. I report for Metro TV. Thank you for the book. Uh, in addition to the soft copies you gave us. So, my question, I'm not sure if it's really a question. I'm looking at the, the last policy, the behavioral and mindset change. I actually believe it is the top policy upon which the rest can possibly be built. Because I think our topmost problem has to do with behavioral and mindset change. 
right from leadership to followership. And I also think that if that can be situated within the educational policy, I've gone through the educational policy briefly, but I didn't really capture anything that has to do with critical thinking for students. I mean, if the basic education is very important to us. So I think that to have um, behavioral mindset change will be um, more effective if formally implemented to start with uh, a new generation of a people, yes. Yes, so I'm not sure it's a, it's a question. I think it's just a suggestion I'm, I'm giving, comparing the policies that has been pre presented. Now, my question really has to do with energy sector. You said page 55, I eliminate doom so and achieve sustained and reliable, uh, reliable supply power within a period of six months. Is it an admission? Thank you. Is it an admission? that DUMSO, um, your former, or the government you are formerly a part of, did not eliminate DUMSO. Um, why so? And what's the possibility that within six months you can give us, achieve, uh, you, you can make us achieve sustained, reliable power supply? Thank you. So that's the second set. Yes. I, I must say that I'm so impressed with, with you, uh, my friends from the media, um, that you're really taking the trouble to read and you're making references. You need to hold us to account, and I'm happy that that's what you're doing. Mr. Alfred Okansi, Conduct of Public Sector Officers Bill. I'm fully in support of that. In fact, I was in cabinet when this was brought before us, and I was hoping that it, the bill would have now gone through the process and would have been already passed in Parliament. But unfortunately, this has not been done. And I want to assure you and the people of this country that that clearly is one of the most important items of reform, in my view, that I'd like to uh, pursue. Because, you know, it is all linked with the challenge of dealing with corruption. How is it that somebody finishes school, he has never done any work before. All of a sudden, the guy has built houses, not just a house. And you can see that his circumstances have changed <laughs> without explanation. <laughs> How? How do we tolerate these things? So I'm fully in support of this bill going to process and being passed. But I'm not even sure that that alone, having read through the bill, and I'm not sure that even that alone will deal substantively with the lack of compliance to ethics as public officers. It's because people who are now trying to uh, build their, their lives are the ones who are going into politics. I went into politics when I was already, by the grace of God, already made up. So there's nothing that I'm looking for again in politics. I, 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 it may sound even at the risk of sounding a bit boastful, but that's how it should be. If you're going to politics to build your house, then <laughs> you're in trouble in this country. In fact, before you take a position, we must check whether, in fact, you have certain things you have already. If now you are coming to, uh, to, to build your, your war chest through politics, then it's very dangerous. So if you look at the provisions of the GTP in respect of dealing with the conduct of public office. We are talking about lifestyle audit and asset tracking. So declaring your asset, yes, that's good. But maybe it's only at the end of your term of office that you are again requested 
to declare your assets for it to be compared. But it will be too late. And by that time, you may have escaped through the processes. So there has to be a real-time tracking of how public officers are responding to the demands of these provisions. And the only way is through life, uh, you call lifestyle audits. I know some people feel very uncomfortable with that. Such a quota, Kesia, Nam, we are time, Akesia. How are you financing that? How much do you earn as a minister to be blowing, you know, money like that? <laughs> I see your okay, is hiding. Because they say, if you are not involved with a minister, I'm not paying. I say, ah, my, 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 But anyway, I think that, uh, uh, Alfred, just to be very direct, yes, I'm fully in support of the passage of this bill. I'm fully in support of declaring assets, and I'll do so willingly. And I'm fully in support on proceeding with some of the other recommendations that I've made in the GTP. Number two, when we have a morning show, the first is with the appointment of my position as chairman of a cabinet subcommittee on economy. I hear this has become a matter of interrogation. And it just shows the level of negativity in our country. If the chair of the economic management team, who is currently the vice president, has not been able to arrest the dollar, or has not been able to substantively deal with the economy, and now we are in an economic crisis, and people are talking about it, how is it that his supporters are now saying that, oh, but Alan was also chairman of a subcommittee of cabinet, a subcommittee of cabinet. Uh, do you understand what a subcommittee of cabinet is? Because a committee of cabinet or subcommittee of cabinet is a subcommittee. You process documents and forward it to cabinet for discussion and approval. If that were the case, then you should blame the president, not a cabinet committee chairs. Because everything is processed and make made sure that it fulfills the requirements of cabinet memoranda and submitted to cabinet. We don't take decisions at subcommittees of cabinet. I mean, if you've been associated with corporate governance. You know, it's a simple matter. A subcommittee of a board cannot take decisions on behalf of, of the board. Does it happen that way? <laughs> you can only make recommendations and process it for the consideration of cabinet. No. So uh, my, my worry is the use of executive time and air time to try and uh, absorb people from, you know, Obvious, it's not a misdemeanor now. <laughs> Responsibilities, you know. So, I mean, that's the only thing that I would say. That being a chair of a cabinet subcommittee does not put responsibility on your hand. It's the same, it's the same thing applies to this issue of, oh, but you are part of the uh, old government. So, for example, if there is doom so, because I was Minister for Trade and Industry, I should come and account for doom so. Does it make sense? The issue of a president and a vice president, because it's one ticket. Vice president, president, there's no difference, one ticket. The value is the same. That, has, that is completely different from responsibilities of sector ministers. Are you saying that I should take responsibility for what happened in the Ministry of Agriculture? No. Or, or let's say, what happened in the Sports Ministry? The, 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 the fact of 
collective responsibility is not the same as individual accountability. Collective responsibility is not equal to individual accountability. The fact that you are all part of it, so now you are individually accountable for the omissions and uh, acts and omissions of everybody in government. That would be ridiculous. So um, please, that's my answer to that. But secondly and more importantly, I have proposed substantive reductions and abolition of taxes. So um, my sister from Omiya FM made a very important inquiry. So if you are going to reduce all these uh, taxes, how are you going to have the revenue? It's very simple. The amount of money we will save from dealing with corruption alone can take us out of IMF. <laughs> all the money is going into people's pockets. All the money is going into people's pockets. If you know the level of corruption, and it's not just about MPP, NDC, both of them, you know. So we have no choice anyway to bring taxes down. We have no choice. I, I, I'm an economist and a lawyer, but I think like an engineer. So you start off from the point that you cannot have an enterprise economy or a competitive economy with high taxes. It's not going to help the private sector. And so when we talk about low taxes, and the GTP is saying that with a kind of tax regime that I'm proposing, Ghana will be the lowest tax regime in the whole of ECOWAS during an alarm presidency. <laughs> so I've been very specific about that. All those taxes, how is it that we are still charging COVID-19 levy? Does it make sense? That you are charging disinfection levy. What are you disinfecting? <laughs> Maybe I disinfected the country. <laughs> but, uh, so what are those taxes for? It's a lazy way of making, making up for failed policies in terms of making sure that leakages in our revenue regime does not occur. So all I can say is that we sh there should be no excuses. Those taxes have no place in our economic environment. And that's why I've been bold to say that they should all go. And at any rate, if we have the chance of discussing the industrial revolution and transformation and the new agricultural revolution that I'm proposing the GDP, you know where the revenue is going to come from. Because when you are dealing with an enterprise economy, the whole economy is driven by the private sector. So you are expanding the power and the reach of the private sector. And that is where you make money. And if you read the section on taxes, I'm saying that we have to re-engineer our tax structure. Right now, Ghana makes more tax revenue from indirect taxes than direct taxes. Indirect taxes, by definition, are taxes imposed, let's say, duties from the ports. So we have piled up so much duties and taxes on, on port operations because we feel that it is easy for us to collect money. Once you import, you have to pay. But it is make the entry point. It is making our private sector uncompetitive. So we'll strip all those duties and taxes from the ports and let our private sector become competitive. If they come, become competitive and they make money, then they would like to contribute and pay taxes. And that's where you expand the tax base. So there's so many that ideas about how we can expand our revenue base and not rely on the kind of taxes that we are currently relying on. So that's why I've been very bold to propose it. And at any rate, if you look at the GTP, in terms of uh, budget deficit, deficits, in terms of our debt to GDP ratio, it's all very clear that this is going to be 
the most officially run economy if Alan becomes president. Yeah. Then the next one is about, uh, that's a TV3 morning show, Commander. And I'm happy you brought this up because I've had the occasion to talk about this on various occasions. I'm surprised that the NDC has up to now not been held accountable and not been held to account for the fact that you go and borrow $32 million to build a factory. By the time the factory is finished and installed and is commissioned, two, three months after evaluation puts it not, the value at no more than 15 to $16 million. Can you imagine that? First time I stepped into the Ministry of Trade and Industry, knowing how controversial this commander factory was, I decided that, look, I believe in continuity in government. So if the NDC has already gone through a process of, of loading this to a private sector, there's no problem. Let me invite that person to come and take over the factory. I don't need to start a new process because we want to bring in a new person. I invited the gentleman who won the bid. This was just two months before the NDC left office. Two months before. Remember, the factory itself was commissioned when it was not fully operational. But that's by the way. And then at the same time, they made an effort. It went through a process of competitive bidding. The man who won the bid, when I invited him to come and take over the factory, he said, the amount of money that I bid for, it was just for bidding purposes. The factory, the factory does not deserve that amount of money you're asking for. So he said he's not going to pay. He's not interested in can you imagine giving an opportunity to somebody who has won a bit, a different party, he said he will not touch it. That is why we initiated another round of, of, of looking for investors. And everything went through parliament, uh, through cabinet, every single thing. We went through cabinet. All the people who bid for that, none of them put it more than $15 million, did for $35 million, in fact, a new one. Now, there was a Ghanaian who bid about 20 million for it. I called the person, come and take it. The man was running away. <laughs> People were bidding $10 million for this. So I again called the, the, the transaction advisor. I said, what is happening? It, it, it beats my imagination. This is just six months after we have taken over power. What is this discrepancy? We borrowed 32 million. Now everybody is saying that it's not worth 32 million. So I said, you organize the first uh, transaction valuation. So please do it. Check again. I know. I, I cannot blame you because you are, you are, you are not uh, valuers. But at least you commission people to value as part of the transaction exercise. So call another valuer. I won't take the business away from you because you are a reputable international organization. I know you do your job. So there's no problem. Let's not fight about it. Because NDC is making noise. After defrauding the country, they are still making noise about this. So I said, OK, let's call another valuer and let them value it. Then they said it will not cost more than $60 million. Then I realized that we are in trouble. And so under normal circumstances, we, I ought to have abandoned the factory. Because it is almost like putting a certain white elephant along your path. Of course, at that time, I was in the party. so. An elephant, I say, oh, this is, we, we don't, at that time, you say, we don't deal with white elephants. So let's see whether we can do something for the community. So I again sent a proposal to a cabinet for them to reevaluate this because we cannot leave it to rot. So then they agreed 
that we should. And I'm, I'm happy that the lady has actually done her homework. So I took it to cabinet. And all the people who bid for it, there was only one person who later on said that, look, he is going to take it up for a certain period. I think maybe 15 years or something like that. And he was going to pay a certain amount, three million, as you said. I took it to cabinet, cabinet approved it. We we're all very happy, as the lady said, we knew that if you consolidate the three million per, per annum, then you would still get your money back. Lo and behold, we got our lawyers. Then the man started running away. <laughs> now changing the goalposts. Uh, no, you have to guarantee me this. I cannot pay three million. And I realized that it was not going to happen. So I went back to cabinet and I said, look, it demonstrates one thing that there was some fraudulent work on this thing. So if we don't want it to rot, then let's find a management partner. Let's invite somebody to come and put it in good shape and then run it for some time until it becomes attractive to another investor. And then we can cut our losses. Because at that point it was, and we asked for a forensic audit on that, Yoko. So I'm using this opportunity to find out from Yoko, what have they been able to establish the difference between the, the figures? Because we have nothing to do, our hands are clean. We have nothing to do with this. We did not borrow the money. We did not do the evaluation. So before I left, we got a management contractor who came and put it in good shape before I left. And we even invited the president to see the process going on. So now I hear that uh, my successor has now taken a decision and he's right because you cannot leave it to rot. So he is taking a decision that once we, the MPP government at my time was able to bring it back to life and he has succeeded, then let us now lease the property. You see, because you should not expect the three million again because nobody is ready to pay that amount of money because the numbers don't add up. So that's the only explanation. That's the only explanation. Then, yes. No, so no, so I think the decision that the minister has taken is right. They don't need to cancel it. They, 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 they should give it for the lease and if it's one million, they can. Now, government has to cut its losses because the numbers don't add up in the, for, in the first place. And that is why the guy who promised to pay three million, when it was given to him, maybe he only said it because he thought that that would make him win. But after that, it was obvious that he couldn't. He was running away from the project. Now, the next one was in respect of VRCs. Was that? BRCs. No, reducing size of government. I think we're still from TV3. Reducing the size of government. And you wanted to find out why the Ministry of Information is not part of our list of 40 ministries. What does the Ministry of Information do? What does the Ministry of Information do? I'm not interested in a, ministry, a whole ministry talking about uh, the government projects and what, what does it do? You check all the matured economies. Have you heard any uh, matured economy with a minister for information? <laughs> no. So uh, it's a waste pipe. It's a, the, that ministry does not add anything. You know. I'm sorry all my friends who are in the ministry of information, don't worry. I'll turn all of you into business people. You make more money than sitting in the, uh, you know, but because, you see, the, the reason why I'm very confident, I talk confidently about these matters, is because I've been around. In the early 80s, in the early 80s, I was the leader of the team that did the first major restructuring of the Ministry of Information. I created 
the new structure of an information services department, ISD. And I remember when I was with MDPI, you know, well, at that time we were responsible for all the major government uh, projects in terms of consulting assignments. And I remember um, it was Toby Kwachi who, who took over at a point in time as minister. And he always was recommend, uh, commending me for the work that I did in the 80s. Because when you do good work, the, the, the record is always there. My name is there. So I know what I'm talking about. You don't need the Ministry of Information. You can save a lot of money and use it to support our young people. Yes. That's the only reason. Why. Then Happy FM, BRCs. And I'm so pleased that you brought this up. You all remember the NDSSI, National Board for Small Scale Industries. When I took office, knowing what the NDSSI, the state in which it was, because remember, in 1990, I started the Empitech Ghana Foundation, which developed many of the high performing Ghanaian companies in this country now, including Kasapreko. And I know Kasapreko is always proud if I mention his name. From where I took Kasapreko in, uh, in the 90s to where they are now. Now, at that time, NDSSI, I was, a, I was running this as a, a private sector project sponsored by the UN. And NDSSI, our counterpart, was a government doing almost the same thing. So NDSSI has never really had the muscle to support companies. They've always been struggling. So as soon as I got the opportunity, I became minister uh, under President Kufor. I said that I will transform NDSSI. And I created a new agency, the Ghana Enterprises Agency. And if you see what we've done with the GEA now, all the development partners are rushing to support a GEA because now there's an institutional renewal exercise that has gone on. And as part of this, I was able to convince the African Development Bank and the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, that if you are a development partner, yes, you are supporting us. At any rate, the money is not even a grant. In most cases, it's not a grant. So you have to feed into what I want to do as a minister. Normally, they don't like to listen and hear that kind of language, that you are telling them what they should do. They don't like it. Abu Sakara has been in this game for a long time. I've always insisted, any time I've been minister, I insist that development partners work within our own vision and framework. Initially, they are resistant, but they've always loved it. And so in this particular case, both IFAD and ADB accepted that we will start building what we call business resource centers. Because I started working on this enterprise economy even when I was minister under President Kufuado. And so I said, look, if we need to develop entrepreneurs, you come out of school, you don't have a job. Does it make sense that you should continue without a job? So do something. But how do you start? You have to go somewhere where they can teach you the building blocks for owning your own business. So these are business resource centers, 67 of them. You see these business resource centers, you make me the next president of, of, of Ghana. State of the art. And I recruited people who are high performing from people in the private sector to come and manage these business resource centers. Being a, a, a minister and a politician, I could easily have said, oh, let's you know, just put civil servant. I said, no, it doesn't work like that. If you want to train an entrepreneur, it's not a civil servant that you use. Bring people from the private sector and let them come and do it. So I brought them in and everybody saw the value of it. And all the development partners were so happy. They started replicating what I had done in other countries. And after the first year, I said, 
this should not be a burden on government. So let us bring private sector participation into these business resource centers so that government does not have any commitment. You, government has built the infrastructure, but the people who are running it, they should run it, make money, take part of it, and then pay themselves. So there's no commitment. And so I created a franchise arrangement. See, these are the business solutions for an enterprise. I said, look, yes, this business resource center, if you are a consultant in the private sector, you come, we give you a franchise, like KFC and all these things, McDonald's. We give you a franchise. At, at, at the end of every year, you pay a, a franchise fee, and then government actually earns money. Are you getting me? Beautiful model. So we, we introduced that. And the people we brought in, they were bold enough to say that this is the way to go. And then they all signed franchise agreement with GA. Now, all of a sudden, what I hear is that government is now truncating the franchise agreement, illegally truncating the franchise agreement, and going to bring civil servants to run this again. Frankly, I can't even believe it. When you are saving government money from government now finding every month resources to pay people. So I'm no longer in government, but I want to use this opportunity to make uh, an appeal to my brother, uh, the current Minister for Trade and Industry. He shouldn't buy into that politics that is going on. You know, let them give that opportunity to those who can run it. Of course, put the right people who can run it as a franchise. You know, if somebody cannot run it as a franchise, you bring in another person. That is the way, not to now create an avenue for civil servants now to, can a civil servant train an entrepreneur? And why should government pay salaries? to put somebody there who himself cannot run a business. It, it doesn't add up for me. You know? So if the problem is with the fact that some of them are not making money, that's fine. You can put in new people, but not to totally uh, spoil that concept, a concept that is being heralded by the development partners who put money in there. They want to replicate it. Then now we are truncating it. So it's only advice. Now, very quickly, me Metro TV, uh, the Rivera cluster. Again, now I really um, I have self-fulfillment. Today, what has happened with the media, the quality of questions they are putting, I've been listening to some of the other encounters. This is the first time that I've seen real substantive questions being put. <laughs> so. Um, I'm overjoyed. Now I know that I really have a, a, a partner in development. But you have to make me president for it to, uh, the, the media so we can work together. By the way, if you look at, at the GTP, I've also proposed that we will create the civil society uh, organizations as the fifth estate of the realm. If we have the executive, we have the judiciary, we have legislature, we have media, and we have CSOs. CSOs. Ghana will rise again. <laughs> and, and I agree with you, therefore, this behavioral cluster. You know, the clusters are not arranged in an order of importance. But even though it comes at the end, I agree with you that it's the foundation. Because without a change of the mindset, I think I made allusion to this in my opening mind. Without a change in the mindset, you cannot deal with corruption. You cannot deal with maintenance of roads. You cannot deal with the environment. You cannot deal with galamse. You, so many problems that we are having now is because of the wrong mentality. So I agree with you. But all the five classes in the GTP, the economy, the governance, which includes the constitutional reforms and corruption, social services, infrastructure, 
and then environment and natural resource management, and then behavioral, they are interlocking. They reinforce each other. So they are independent, but interrelated. So you are preaching to the converted. And I think that um, you cannot have progress with the other classes without the behavioral. Last but not the least, uh, on doing so. In fact, I was amazed that the government was trying to defend itself that there was no doing so. When it was obvious that we were having challenges. So changing the label does not change the status of our energy sector. But we've made, because of time, I cannot go into it, but we've made very specific proposals. The problem is not with generation. That's not a problem. In fact, at a point in time, and I'm sure it's still the case, that we have actually excess power. I've left government, I have to be sure whether that's still the case. We have excess power. The problem has to do with the public sector control of the energy institutions. Do you know how many agencies there are under the Ministry of Energy? That would be the first candidate for cutting. Energy Commission, Petroleum Commission, uh, NPA, GMPC, BOST, ECG. You know. So there's so much confusion because you have all these agencies falling over each other. And can you imagine with my proposal, not just to cut the ministries. It, cutting the ministries is only a small thing, but consolidating departments and agencies consolidating them, the amount of savings we will make alone just from consolidating departments and agencies will pay for our IMF, uh, the, what we need to pay for our creditors. So I feel that the proposals I've made with uh, uh, doing so, it is very clear, put the private sector in charge of our energy sector. And most of these problems will be resolved. Put the private sector in charge. If you go to the US, maybe Pennsylvania has a power company and they do generation distribution. You go to California, they have, it's all private sector. If you bring private sector involvement to do this, the dynamics will change efficiency capital because why is it that we have all these intermittent uh, power outages because of lack of investment in our transmission infrastructure government does not have the money it would never have the money to rebuild our infrastructure the only way is to bring in the private sector they put in more money they will bring in the efficiency and then you regulate how much they can take in terms of uh, charges. And that, that's, it's, that, that's what happens everywhere in, in, uh, in, the, in, in the matured economies. Yes, thank you very much. So two quick announcements before the next set of questions. them already. <laughs> so, uh, Aviva is one of them. Kafu is one of them. Uh, Mr. Speaker. All right. And, and Selom. And Selom. <coughs> so, we have the five. Okay. Then the last round, uh, we will also have five. We're ready to take off. Aviva, let's go. Just one question. 
Strictly one question. Oh, one question, but uh, strictly one question. A bit of clarity on a yes, something like the question of beside, and I'll tie it in with the immediate. But I can tell you to not finish yes, yes, yes. A jack of we day, nay, joy from for your friend, right? And here, Jamis, I miss me, yes, yes. Could you answer any other with your friend, right? Now, this one that you want to deal with a year corruption. Nepotism. I'm saying, oh, my president, I just said, I'm going to go to my appointment. Right, so my question one would be clarity on a year. Um, Joy FM host to know Nidia Obusaye about the amendment of the Constitution. Uh, you are a lawyer, so then it gives me the opportunity to ask you that the Constitution itself provides modes through which we can amend it. Now, we call Article 289 and 290, where there is entrenched provision, at least we have about uh, four ends to the amendment. That, um, seek for the views of the people, just as Professor Emeritus Abed Kodjo Fiojo commissioned it. Then the second end will be the introducing of bills to parliament now, with Article 71 and Article 78, the same people who are benefiting from those articles during that period are supposed to go through the middle end of the amendment process. Um, what more would minister Thirdly, it goes as far as even the justices of our courts, Article 71, you can't hear the general politicians in Kwanzaa. The justices of our courts, where we seek for justice, we are not going to be able to do it. We are not going to be able to do it. We are not going to That is one. Now, in tying in with a year, sir, amendment process, we can see sloganeering, and we can see Kurebia, a year GTP. Uh, in the likely event, not unlikely, likely event that Ghanaians give you the power to lead this nation, obviously your end, your tenure of service will come to an end. And if it does, uh, there will be a takeover. How sure are you, whoever will take over from you, will continue your processes? And in solving that, we had Act 49, Act 479, and Act 480 of Ghana's parliament, where the NDPI, now NDPC, which you were part of, it's just an advisory body. People have said, said we should make it an NDPA, that is National Development Planning Authority, that will come up with a long-term development plan of the nation, which comes in short to middle-term uh, development, that is coterminous with every government. Uh, what is your take on that? Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good evening to you, Mr. Chomati. My name is Kwame Apia Kubi, host of Kesben uh, FM and TV's Breakfast Show. Now, my question has to do with uh, page 76 of your plan, and it talks about the environment and then climate change. You have told us since the beginning of this particular event that, in fact, you championed the introduction of a lot of the automobile companies coming into our country. And in so doing, I believe strongly that you are very much aware of how the world is fastly moving and then transitioning from the use of fossil fuel as well as carbon emissions in our environment, thereby introducing electric vehicles into the system. The question is that with the introduction of automobile companies, just as you stated, and then not considering this particular agenda of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, what is Ghana's latest position? And as well, uh, reading from page 76, I'm really, really not uh, satisfied with the provisions I see there. So if you can really expand it. And in relation to that, the European Union has equally, since 2020, December 1st, has passed regulations on deforestation to a far extent the EU Parliament is telling you that they are banning products from deforested areas. So your cocoa and the coffee you are producing by way of destroying your forest and your environment, 
those products, you cannot export them again once they are able to trace the source of those particular products. And this is the current state of our nation, where we are destroying our forest reserves, allowing people to mine within our forest zones with impunity. The question again is that, what is your policy in tackling the menace of Galamse? Because I read from page 77 that you are going to abolish Galamse within two years. Tell us and tell the good people of Ghana how you intend to achieve that. Thank you. I greet you all. My name is Kafri Day in GTV Breakfast. Uh, four quick questions. Kalam uh, say, how do you change the color of the water of the pra, which is almost as bright as your color, <laughs> within the time period that you specified on page 77, eliminating Kalam say within two years? Will it change the color? That's number one. Uh, number two, second question. I see that you, the eastern, eastern region is going to be the science, research, and innovation hub for West Africa. Why? I want to know. Uh, thirdly, you said you, you, there's a, it's going to be an enterprise economy. Are we going to now have our, our economy at the risk of being controlled by foreign interests who have the money? And the last one has to do with patriotism. It's on, I think it's uh, page 81. If I do a test right now, most people cannot say the pledge and cannot sing the anthem. I had the privilege of speaking with a, an ambassador from one of the Latin American countries, and when she spoke about the love for her country, she was almost in tears. How do you get Ghanaians to love Ghana? Because if we don't love Ghana, all this will not work. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. My name is Nanaya Ofianko, and I host the Agenda Show on Atinka TV and the AM Drive on Atinka FM. And I'm taking my question from page number 45. And you talked about amending some articles where you indicated that you're going to abolish the Council of State. Will I be right to conclude that you do not see their relevance? Thank you. Good evening. My name is Salom Adunu from City FM and Channel One Television. Um, I must say that, let me also commend you on the, uh, the cluster number six on behavioral and mindset change. Um, I think, and I'm happy that you've identified that as a, as a software to run our you know, collective consciousness towards development and prosperity. My, my question really is on education. Um, the objective is to implement a free education throughout, I mean, early child, basic, secondary as we have it now, and then tertiary. Um, I've not seen cost, I've not seen the costing or funding for that. And also, just yesterday we heard that the NDC is planning or has proposed to do a tuition free level 100 entry. You know, they, they spoke about funding in some sense. I've not seen the funding in this one. I'll be happy to know how you, have, you fund that, even though I've seen you mention get fund and a few things in there. I mean, we, we need some more flesh to that. Um, also, it's a four-year term or a four-year term. Um, when exactly in your four-year term will you hope to make tertiary education free from level 100 to 400? As a corollary to that, um, I see free SHS as well. Very important program. But from what I have here or you have here, it does appear that you want a certain uh, review or rethink around it. Which specific aspect of the free SHS will you want reviewed? And would that also include targeting the program so that those who can pay, pay, and those who cannot pay, you know, are assisted by the country, given our current economic position. Thank you. So that's the third set of five. Uh, we are aware that many of you are morning show uh, people, and therefore uh, in a hurry. But enjoy this. Enjoy this. Then I'll make it very quickly. First, um, Article 289, and then the reference to Article 71, the amendments. I agree with you completely that there's a potential challenge 
in bringing this into existence because of the individuals who will be involved in making the proposals happen because it affects them directly. But if you read it carefully, the challenge here as we have is ring fencing a certain number of officials and putting them under one category whilst others are in different categories. That is really the challenge. My, my sense of the cry of Ghanaians about Article 71 holders is the fact that why are we ring fencing them from the others? That is my understanding. So when we talk about dealing with Article 71, we are saying that bring all those public sector officials, including those in the judiciary, as you rightly pointed out, to an independent emoluments commission. Now, our view is that instead of setting up an independent emoluments commission, try and strengthen the current Fair Wages Commission and then bring everybody under that provision and that, that institutional framework. And then it will become much easier for us to do the comparative analysis of who should earn what. So you don't need to have these different categories. In and by itself is discriminatory. So if you are one institution which we are proposing as the Fair Wages, an empowered Fair Wages Commission to deal with all classes, then I don't think that there will be that violent disparity that Ghanaians are complaining of. So it doesn't matter that it will affect them or not. This is a proposal to ensure that we address these disparities. And the fact that they will go through a process, and I agree with you, they go through a process, but this is very simple. It doesn't matter whether they are involved or not. This is the proposal that will bring sanity and confluence to the determination of emoluments. So that's the way we are looking at it. Number two, you talked about, yes, Alan becomes president after four years if there has to be a continuation. How does it work out based on the GTP? It works out from the very concept of having a government of national unity and an independent presidential candidate. So the, the new political regime and dispensation that we are proposing guarantees continuity. Conceptually, it guarantees continuity because if it's a government of national unity in which all political parties are involved, in which different stakeholder groups are involved, the business community, the labor unions, uh, farmers, traditional authorities, faith-based organizations, they are all involved, then the issue of continuity does not really arise. But if Alan becomes president as an independent candidate, it then consolidates this whole concept of an inclusive government. And so that the president is a president of Ghana, not of NPP or of NDC. That is the transition that we need to get to. And then the continuation then becomes, I think, one of mainstreaming this whole concept, first of government of national unity, and also selecting the president on the basis of his own merit and record. And Professor Kwesi Prempe, Prempe has written a beautiful article about independent uh, candidates. It's a new political dispensation that Ghana has no choice but to transition to. Just across our borders, 
in Benin. Two continuous terms when they've had independent candidates. You will not recognize Benin again. Because the man is there for Ghana and not for the parties. And Benin is moving. The most successful president of the United States without any debate, George Washington, served two terms. In both terms, he was an independent candidate. Independent president. And he actually warned about the negativity associated with dual policy. He warned at, at that time, if you read up on George Washington, this will be very clear. So again, continuation of power is aligned to this whole concept of inclusiveness, a government of national unity, a government by the people, for the people and of the people, headed by an independent uh, candidate, who is selected on his own merit. That's the way I see it. Then the long-term development plan also speaks to one of the fundamental pillars for the movement for change. Because what the movement for change is saying is that we have to move beyond party manifestos and develop a national plan. So this GTP is the foundation for a national development plan. Uh, this is a policy framework, and that's how a national development plan ought to start from. First, the policy framework, and then it goes into the next phase, which is implementation modalities for the policies. And that the third phase is the programming and the pro projects with the budgets. Then you have the complete national development plan. There's a lot of grammar, as the Nigerians would say, in our current national development plan. I mean, frankly, if you read what the GTP uh, is recommending and read the national development plan, you see the difference. You know, this is solution oriented. But if you read our national development plan, it's mixed up with analysis, with problems associated with uh, sectors. By the time you get to what you really are recommending, you are already lost. So in, in organization and management, the technical definition of a policy is that it is a guide to action. That's what a policy is. So once you get the, and that's why this is a framework, this is a policy framework, and then you elevate it to the modalities and to the budget. So you are preaching to the converted, except that the current understanding of what a national development plan should look like is different from what we are proposing. But we are aligned on one thing, that if Ghanaians will accept this GTP, it will go a very long way. And successive governments will basically continue with whatever previous governments would have left off. Kasmin, the transition to ele electric vehicles. Again, I have to be careful about the statements I make. I want to confirm to you that this whole energy transition debate and discourse in the world has relevance to some economies, but not to a developing country. In many of our countries, do you know the contribution of developing countries in Africa in particular to the whole carbon debate? I think Africa contributes less than what? Less than, oh, definitely not even 5%, 3% or so. You know. So all the noise that people are making has nothing to do with Africa. The real culprits for carbon emissions has nothing to do, they develop the economies. And so now, if we are talking about transition to, let's say, electric vehicles, and the suggestion is that we should abandon combustion engines, then it, it, we, we are not understanding the dynamics or the architecture of global power. 
this is our time. Africa. We have resources for oil and gas. We are going to exploit these resources responsibly. But that is what is going to feed into our economies. Do you know that it is the petrochemical industry, which is the adding value to oil and gas, that gives you fertilizers, that will give you bitumen, it will give you plastics. So I, I don't think that for a developing country, it is being suggested that we should not have an opportunity to develop some of these uh, industries on the back of our natural resource. But this also does not mean that we don't believe in the new generation of power. Gen of, of course, Ghana, for example, we have started talking about nuclear energy and hydro energy. In fact, that is the way to go. Solar has a limitation. And this government keeps on talking about solar. Solar has a limitation in various areas, first in terms of how we integrate that with our current transmission infrastructure, and also the capacity for solar extension. And even the cost, if you are looking for cheapest sources of energy, which is also green power, then it's hydro energy, hydro energy and then nuclear energy. So I think that we have agreed in this country that we need an energy mix. And because we have an energy mix, this is not the time for us to abandon investments in uh, fossil fuels. And so the, the assembly of vehicles is only for a transitional period. It's not that we will not also transition. Do you know how long it will take for all these countries themselves to transition? You check. Meanwhile, Africa would make the best use of our fossil fuels to power our combustion engines, and then we will transition at the appropriate time. We will transition at the appropriate time, not dictated by uh, what others are doing. Now, Galam say the GTP makes proposals on how to deal with Galamsey. It's very clear. You cannot wish away Galamsey because if you go to the Galamsey mining areas, many of the young people who are involved in Galamsey, they are involved in Galamsey just like when you go to a farming community, others are farming. What is Galamsey? Galamsey is illegal mining. If you legalize it, it is no longer Galamsey. But the business model that GT, the GTP is proposing is that these young uh, men and women, they are already on the ground. They are not going to leave those sites now or in the future. So what the GTP is proposing is that we group these young people into corporate entities, not cooperatives, into well-structured corporate entities. Government provides seed funding for them to acquire the right equipment, modern equipment, provides working capital, not for free, but concessionary loans without collateral. For these young people, these young people are going to be the owners of those companies. So we are, because we are building an enterprise economy, all of a sudden, all these Galamse boys now become owners of youth-owned mining companies. You have, this is capital accumulation for our young people. And government is providing the support for this to happen. And government then also recruits the right expertise, managers, to help them manage these mining companies. And last but not the least, which is the real deal, is for them to have the right mining licenses. Because once you give them the lease, mining lease, you give them the EPA licenses, it's no longer Galamse. So it's a full package to deal with them. And so when I say within 
one, one year or two years, Alan becomes president. We start corporatizing them. We bring in the equipment. How long does this take? We make things look so complicated. How long does it take? So I'm very confident that it can be done and it will be done. Then the next one is uh, Kafui. I, I think part of what he was interested in also relates to Kalamse. Change the color of, 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 of the yellow waters. This is not Afrofrontal waters. <laughs> but it's, it's the simplest of, 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 of the challenges associated with that. This is basic technology. There's technology all over the world to reduce the tepidity of, of, of these rivers. And so it's just a question of technology. We can literally clean all these uh, rivers with very little effort if we bring in the right technology. But you made a very important point about the proposal to make Eastern Region the new research and technology hub. Part of what the GTP is proposing is that each region will become a center of excellence. So Central Region becomes a tourism hub for West Africa. The Ha'ahafu and Bono, two Bono regions, the three of them become the new tree crop processing hub, including cashew, cocoa, and the rest. And then you have the five northern regions becoming the bread, bread basket for West Africa. And then Ashanti region becomes the new industrial hub, manufacturing hub for Africa. The new industrial, greater Kumasi industrial city. 5,000 acres is already under, uh, 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 under construction. And then research and innovation. If you go to the United States, Silicon Valley is acclaimed all over the world. It was specifically created. It's not as if there was something peculiar to them. It was a strategic development prioritization that they should develop Silicon Valley in that area. So it's the same thing with Eastern Region. And, and that's the reason why that is so. Oh, what Great Accra is the new international financial services center. We are going to create a tax haven and a new financial center in, in, in Accra. And you don't need to go to uh, uh, London, which is a, one of the financial capitals. You don't need to go to Zurich. You don't need to go to Hong Kong. You don't need to go to Singapore. The amount of money in Africa now will be consolidated in Ghana, in this new financial service center. And that's when you have the big banks all coming to establish their corporate headquarters once Ghana becomes the international financial. This is something that has been discussed. But under an Alam presidency, it's going to happen. Volta, is, Volta region is going to be the skills hub. You see, if you, if you audit the GTP, the 10 new strategic industries that we are proposing that will diversify the economy beyond cocoa, bauxite and aluminum, iron and steel, the component assembly, vehicle assembly, vegetable oils and fats, the manufacturing of machinery and equipment. You can't industrialize and import all the machines that you need. So in, under the GTP, we'll, we'll start manufacturing our own machinery and equipment. Germany, Austria, Turkey, all that, Korea, that's what happens. So you need the skills base for the projects under the GTP to occur. And so that will be the center of excellence for skills development. It doesn't mean that you cannot have skills developed anywhere else. But when we talk about center of excellence, it means that the prioritization for water region is, is, is that one. So that's what we mean by 
And then I think um, Kafui was also looking at whether an enterprise economy will not put the economy in the hands of foreigners. If, again, you read carefully the provisions in, the, in this, the most dominant theme is building indigenous private capital. Indigenous private capital. That is really the focus of this. And that's why there's so much emphasis on there is no young person in Ghana under an alarm presidency who would say, I don't have a job. It's not going to happen. Because all the kinds of entry points for a young person to either get into self-employment or to have a formal job, it's all there. I've done this all over Africa. In the 90s, I think Yawabe was talking about South Africa. When Mandela came out of prison and realized that he needed to be able to uplift the black people of South Africa, and the only way to do that was to build black businesses. Seven experts around the world, I was one of them that he invited. So if you go to Uganda, you go to all these countries, even Mauritius, I set up Enterprise Mauritius, and I'm still heralded in Mauritius. So uh, why we cannot do that in Ghana is, is, is confounding. And that's why I think that we shouldn't be worried about the domination of, however, I must also add that you cannot optimize the accumulation of wealth without bringing in foreign capital, particularly if you don't want to borrow, because that's, the, that's where the problem is. But when you bring in foreign investors, you must have a program of joint ventureship and collaboration between foreign companies and local companies. And the beauty of this is that we are preparing our local entrepreneurs and enterprises to become competitive enough to feed into the foreign companies. So everything is related to one another. another. Yes. Patriotism. I think uh, I'm happy that the lady who talked about the fact that the anchor of Ghana's growth has to be the mindset cluster. And I'm happy you have introduced or you are bringing to the fore this issue of patriotism. In the 60s, if you traveled and you mentioned that you were Ghanaian, you were very proud of it. Now all that is lost, all that is lost. And so the GTP is emphasizing the need for us to promote patriotism. But like you said, it's not a standalone thing. We have to infuse that in our educational curriculum. And I think there was a lady who also talked about critical thinking. Uh, because, as I said, this is a policy framework. You may not have all the details, but I agree with you 100%. The new curriculum that we are looking at is curriculum that would ensure that the behavior and mindset change will start with our educational curriculum. That's where it will start from. And also from our homes. Our homes and our schools. That's where the, the new behavioral mindset will come from. Kafui, uh, is that okay? I think that's what, yeah. Yes. Then Atinka, Council of State, you wanted to know whether by implication, I'm saying that the Council of State, what word did you use? Irrelevant. <laughs> I have some of my uncles and my godfathers in the Council of State. I don't want to use this platform to say that they are irrelevant. But the Council of State, by, by, by the constitutional nature of it right now, is irrelevant. <laughs> not, not the people within it. Not the people within it. I'm saying by the constitutional nature of the Council of State right now, it is relevant. And so we have to transition that. All the good people who are currently in, in, in the Council of State, 
they should all now be re, re channeled you know, to this new second chamber, which is going to be the real oversight of executive action. You can't have a president that has no limits. You're only building a thing God and without any control. So parliament, yes, has an oversight, but the, parliament, the oversight of parliament as it is defined in the constitution now is not optimal. And that's why you need a second. Second chamber is also an additional oversight over executive action so that we can limit the powers of the executive. That is where you have the real checks and balances. Once we get to that stage, Ghana will grow so rapidly and Ghana will rise again. Then CTFM, um, you were interested in the proposals on uh, free SHS and then other, other elements of our educational, uh, educational uh, structure. Now, this GTP reinforces the constitutional aspiration of free basic education where education now extends beyond primary but is the, it goes through the entire continuum. It's the aspiration. The implementation of it, however, has to be defined in more detail. And that is why when you read about our approach to free SHS, we say categorically that the free SHS is a good policy and must be continued. But we need to be able to have an, an understanding, a comprehensive understanding of the implications of the free SHS. First, and I, I, I think it's useful that I just read this. It says that I wanted to read the, the exact uh, 60, 60 what? Page 66, sir. 66. So it okay. says. OK, you can read it. To realize this objective, well, let me read the entire thing. Page 67, in respect of SHS. Conduct a comprehensive review of the free SHS program with a view to improving its operationalization, particularly that, in that, that, that is the key. Repeat that. With a view to improving its operationalization, particularly in respect of one, financial sustainability. Number one. Two, infrastructural requirements. Number two. Three, curriculum development. Three. Four. Capacity building for teachers and non-teaching staff. Four. Five, transitioning free SHS graduates to tertiary education and the world of work. Good. So now you appreciate our views on free SHS. It will continue, but we will undertake a review along these lines. And after free SHS, every SHS graduate will now go into a one-year compulsory internship or apprenticeship program. That is where the mindset is going to start changing after free SHS. You cannot just walk into university with this kind of mindset. The free SHS, let's be honest, it's a good policy. But if you come out to act of free SHS now, you walk straight into the university, and work straight into the world of work. You are not fully baked. But after free SHS, there's a compulsory certificated program of internship. We are talking about how people in other economies seem to be so smart 
Because by the time they get into university, they already are business people. And they understand the work of, the culture of working, even at that young age. So after your one year compulsory internship, you get into university. So there are two streams now. After one year of internship and apprenticeship, you may find that your real value and your destiny does not lie in continuing with university education and that you may start branching. If you decide to branch, then you are getting into self-employment and the BRCs are available for you to hold your hand. And you start becoming an entrepreneur right from the beginning. <laughs> now, with all the support that is guaranteed under the GDP, if you decide to continue through formal education, you go through the university. After university, you have two channels. One channel is you go into the military or the security services. You don't need protocol to get into security services. <coughs> it is automatic. You have two channels after SHS. So if you have gone through the internship and you branch off into business, that is fine. If you continue, your mind is already opened up. But after university, you can either choose to go <coughs> through the security services or you start a new path in life which is start your own business and the program for start your own business has already been referred to in the so it is not possible that you would leave where the value of going through the, the first channel is that the mental and mindset change would occur when you go through that security training. And if you go through the other channel, the other door, and you decide to go into self-employment or to work in formal employment, that reorientation would also uh, uh, be, be guaranteed there. So under the GTP, there's a youth digital platform which is going to guarantee three million jobs within one and a half years. Three million jobs for the youth of Ghana. And it's the easiest thing that will happen. Because if you look at the projects envisaged under the GTP alone, it will be more than three million. However, we need to profile these three million people on a platform even ahead of 2025. So that those who want to get into the petrochemical industry, we already know where to channel the skills development. Those who want to go into uh, uh, industrial machinery and equipment manufacturing, they also understand. So that is going to be uh, the, the, the real deal. And I'm using this opportunity. Very soon, the digital platform will be up. And I want all young people of Ghana to make an effort to come onto the platform. Coming onto the platform is a guarantee to you for a job within uh, one and a half years. One. When the government of national unity comes into power. Then um, the last one is, I think we've done that one. We've done that. That was your okay. last question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, <clears throat> I have a dilemma. This is for the media. There are those who are doing the scenes politics non-transparently uh, to try and see either they get onto the last block or we wind up. Should we continue with the last lot? Yes. So, there. 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 George, you just came. Uh, uh, yeah. It's a young sir. There. Okay, so do I have five? Do I have five? George. Okay, Mr. Youngson, you start. Oh, you're on the phone. Finish off, finish off. So George, you can join. You ready? So this is the last set. Bear with us and we'll wrap up. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Kojo Youngson. I work for Joy. 
if I may add my voice to those who are commending you, uh, Mr. Chairman Ting, for this engagement. It's a very good idea. If anything could make it better, perhaps it would have been if we could have had it during the day. Uh, we're all journalists, so this is actually our day job. You know, so if uh, we had been invited to an event during the day, we would have found the time to be here and contribute. As it is, we're all working overtime now and getting very tired. In fact, my brain is so tired, I had to write down my question on my phone just so I don't forget it. Bear with me. I have just one question, uh, but just before I make it, uh, uh, before I ask it, I have to make a point just to establish the question, if I may. So you distinguish between individual responsibility and collective responsibility uh, in answering. Uh, thank you. Individual accountability and collective responsibility uh, when you were answering an earlier question. Um, but I think you have proved that as a person you believe in collective responsibility because not once, but on a number of occasions when you have disagreed with what a group you are associated with is doing, you've withdrawn from that group. Either you've resigned or you've you know, walked away. So I know you believe in collective responsibility, which means it is fair for us here to ask you questions about the performance of the government that you were a part of. Uh, so if I may, let me ask my question. It's about Galamse. Now, uh, page 77 of your document says that you will eliminate Galamse in two years by enforcing existing laws. Uh, well, um, it sounds familiar because the current president put his presidency on the line and said he would eliminate Galamse. Meanwhile, you were part of his cabinet when 500 excavators disappeared. Several others were burnt in violation of our laws. You didn't resign. You were in cabinet when uh, your Asante Regional Chairman's company was caught red-handed mining illegally in forest reserves. Your boss exonerated him by saying they were not mining as we speak. You didn't resign. You were with them when laws were passed to allow mining in these same forest reserves. You didn't resign. You were part of a government that could not regularize small-scale mining in spite of setting up committees to do exactly that. Nobody was held to account for these failures, and you didn't resign. But you tell us now that you will solve Galamse in two years by enforcing the same laws that the government you were a part of could not enforce. Why should we trust that these aren't just words and that you are actually capable of doing this. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mr. Chamantin. My name is Nene Odomple, and I represent all the Gen Zs, which is the popular generation. And I can find that none of them are here, so I represent them. Yeah, my Gen Z. <laughs> okay, so growing up, um, I, I grew up to, I ran and owned a blog, the 1957 News, which is a digital um, news blog, yeah. So growing up, I, I grew up to President um, Atamels as a president, and we were told he's a calm Asunjehini. So during his time, when people do bad things, he calls them to order by speaking to them calmly. President Mama came into power, and we had a popular term, um, babies with sharp teeth, which means that the young people in his government were holding him to ransom. They were doing things he couldn't call them to order. Now, we're told there was another man who was coming who was a very radical person who could call his people to order and make them do the right thing, which is His Excellency the, pr the President. Um, you are also described as one fine man who is very calm. I'm, I'm saying this because during in President Ekufadu's time, we, we see how the state is supposedly being um, captured by people and they are taking our lands, they are sharing things among themselves. As a fine gentleman, as a man who is very calm, how are you going to hold your appointees to order even when the man who is described as a very radical person is not able to do that?
My name is Sifa Dankwa, and uh, I am the host for the Happy Morning Show. Mecca Tree, it's a Masay Misania Baku Baku Miansa. Oh, oh, me try to tell, me try to tell, uh, Prokunam Yavene Show, so Timmy try to tell. Uh, Chief, what am I, Didi Kain? Yaka Enterprise Economy, meaning say you are chief proponent for a uh, year after. I have a share in the enterprise economy. The autosomy has got to do with. Galam say, "Yenim say en sasi be brinoa na wo me mo." I say, "Do you look at a year reclaiming those lands? Emre ahe en ye be here to reclaim those lands. E ka he en ye be bo e wo ho. E no e ye de tosu e ye mi no. De tosu mi ensa ye advocacy. Eh many mental health authority for wedding come from 2012 ABC Zabri. En pempi na sama mo ka ne say, "Wo mu nya sika en fa ni wo mu juma wo mo die." Offer economic cluster no o kire se o be yi etuo bi e de free ho etuo ba kwa be ye free ho no e ye covid 19 levy this year may na ye mental health month many o mu shia bi wa many o mu din komo asem ba kwa mo kan ye ne se sen ka ye betumi asesa nia ye de covid 19 levy no e yo na nka ye de ama mental health authority in ke betumi abua o be ye hu bibia na medas Good evening. Uh, my name is Dennis. Dennis is a TV Africa Morning Show. I will refer you to page 49 of the GTP, Constitutional Reforms. You've listed 13 areas that you're proposing to reform when uh, you, you're given the nod to serve as the next president of Ghana. Uh, I mean, interestingly, I didn't find one area that many of your predecessors have argued on the term of office. You do not talk about it in this proposal. Does that mean that four years in two terms is enough for you to achieve everything in this GTP? And how much can you achieve in four years? Also a quick um, follow-up to what um, Kojo asked. On, on you serving in this government, many voters voted for you when you campaigned for this government and then you left eventually, will you take the responsibility to apologize for the disappointment that you have also talked about and uh, how you've led some people to also vote for this government? Thank you. Thank you very much. Hon. Jojo Sinvinay is the name I work with Pan African Television. Um, Jojo Sinvinay, yes, please. Uh, your key producer, if I may put it that way. Oh, no, but I just want to find out. Uh, I know, if nothing at all, you've been listening or you've watched the proposals from both parties, the major political parties that we have in this country, NPP and then NDC. Um, I know just only yesterday, if nothing at all, you've listen to what John Dramani Mahama, His Excellency, has been um, sharing with the general public. I just want to know from you, personally, do you think, do you think you have a way to pay through these two political parties, NPP and the NDC? Because when you look at the general public, their focus is towards the NPP and the NDC. That's the political parties they know. Do you think Movement for Change has its own way to pay through these two political parties? Thank you very much. Excellent questions, set of questions throughout. Koyo Yangsin, my nephew, uh, I think the concept of collective responsibility and then individual accountability not being the same actually answers your question. I believe in collective responsibility but not individual accountability. So all I'm saying is that yes, being part of the government, together we are collectively responsible. However, when it comes to accountability, then it cannot be generalized. So exactly as you said, if we promised to deal with Kalamse by 
destroying uh, equipment by doing A, B, C, D. That was the business model that was adopted. I cannot be held responsible for the efficiency or effectiveness of that model. However, I am saying that I'll have a different business model, which is what I have proposed. And by implication, I'm saying that destroying equipment and talking about uh, these other ways of dealing with Kalamse was never going to be sustainable. And that's why it has not worked. So what I'm saying is that dealing with the realities, and I've already alluded to it, that there are people on the ground. And in this particular case, although, as you rightly pointed out, promises were made that they would be given licenses and things. In this particular case, the business model based on the enterprise economy framework is that build their capacity by making sure that you give them the right equipment, you give them the right skills, you give them the working capital, and then on the back of that, you give them the license. So it's not my model is different from just giving them the license. It's making sure that you build their capacity, and then on top of that, you give them the license. So there are two different things. That is the, the model they adopted. It has not worked. I believe that my model will work. Because remember, I've done the same thing under the One District, One Factory program. I was able to bring together groups of young people in communities, 45, 50 in, in a community. And then I got the 1D1F to provide seed money for them to buy modern equipment for maize processing, depending on the comparative advantage of the district in which they are. So the, the, the fiscal infrastructure is built, the factory is built, the equipment is provided. It's not free money, but it's concessionary funding, and it's all facilitated. They don't need collateral, they don't need anything. And then in addition to that, we engage management experts to support them. So out of the 58 companies that we incubated with young people, 22 already have their machinery and their facilities installed, and the rest will be installed soon. So it's just transferring the same model to the mining sector. So I know it will work. And then I think that above all, it's also a question of the fact that these young people, whichever way it is, they also deserve to be assisted. And I think that the business model I'm proposing will make sure that they succeed. Then, uh, did, did you ask any other question? It was just on this one, okay. Then Gen Z, um, if I remember what you said, uh, I think your worry was that, how do I hold my appointees accountable? Because I look so calm. <laughs> do you speak tree? President Kufo once said, say, one who said, so she have a funny pada. And so, you know, to wait, when people get drowned, they only get drowned in cold water, not in hot water. So I'm a calm but very firm person. And that is my style. I don't need to change my style. And I've been very successful as a person. At the age of 22, I was a manager in the leading corporate entity in Ghana, 22 years. So if I was calm and not firm, I wouldn't have survived through the vagaries of the corporate world. And everybody in Unilever, which is UAC at that time, knew I was one of the high-performing uh, executives, even as a young person. So 
My record is clear everywhere. Anybody who works with me know that you can't play around with me. Everybody knows that. But I know how to deal with people. I know how to bring people up. All the people, young people who are now celebrated, many of them, I brought them up. It just comes to memory, uh, unfortunately, John Kuma. I gave John Kuma the first job. I gave John Kuma the first job. He was my political assistant. And I, some of the people are making noise in NPP now. I don't want to mention names. <laughs> they, I brought them up. And if you will be grateful, they should be celebrating me now. Yes, so uh, I'm calm, but behind that facade, I'm more streetwise than, than, than you can think. Uh, yes. But the point is that my, my beautiful wife is uh, making a positive, yes, the witness is here. You cannot mess around with me. It's as simple as that. Everybody who works with me is aware of that. Yes, so now um, I think that was your only concern, Gen Z. Is that correct? Oh, okay. Then after, again, my brother, Happy FM. I'm very happy that you brought in after. You know, I started talking about building an enterprise economy and changing the structure of the Ghanaian economy. When I was at the School of Economics in the early 70s at Legon, my dissertation for my undergrad was changing the structure of the Ghanaian economy, the transformation. This is in the 70s. So I've been talking about transformation, about production, about industrialization, about agricultural transformation since the 70s. And I've been leading this path of an enterprise economy, not only in Ghana, throughout Africa. So I live and talk and I act along those lines. Now, I, in line with that same principle, I was also the chief engineer and the chief architect for the African Continental Free Trade Area. Because I know if you produce, you have to sell. And because of the trade barriers that we have in Africa selling into Europe, United States, and other regions, I knew that the only way my concept of an enterprise economy in Africa would work is to create our own single market. And that is why I led the process to have the AFCFTA. And I also led the process of Ghana becoming the headquarters of the AFCFT. So everything reinforces each other. The AFCFT is going to be the anchor for the enterprise economy. Because you are going to produce, you are going to export. And AFTA provides that opportunity. So that's where AFTA fits in. And I, talk, I think you talked about Galamse. If you read the, the, the GTP, it says that the new mining companies owned by the young people now would also be given additional resources for developing the lands that are reclaimed. And now developing cash crops, like oil palm and other cash crops on the reclaimed land. So everything has been taken care of in terms of the, the, the Galamse and its impact on the environment reclaiming land. And last but not the least, your proposal that we should divert the proceeds from the COVID-19 levy to support mental health. Is that mental health? Yeah. Yes. Now, the only point of departure that I would have with you is that the COVID-19 levy no longer has a place in our tax structure. So it must go. But it does not mean that we should not find sources of supporting uh, mental health delivery. And if you read the health section under the GTP, it is very clear that we will mainstream health, mental health in all health facilities in Ghana. Currently, it's being done, but only for some 
health uh, facilities. I'm talking about mainstreaming that in all health facilities. And also, I know this was mental health, but just as an addition, we are also going to mainstream the use of herbal medicine throughout all our health delivery institutions. And there will be an authority created alongside the Ghana Health Service, which will deal specifically with, with uh, traditional uh, medicine. So basically, yes, the COVID-19 levy should go. We'll find the resources to support mental health delivery. And last but not the least, um, no, I think one more. TV Africa, term of office. I need to make reference to page 45 of the GTP, uh, Roman 6. The proposal is to extend the term of office from four years to five years. And I've already made that proposal. And you are asking whether I would apologize on behalf of the people of Ghana who voted for MPP. Was that the question? Sorry? Oh, people voted for MPP because of me. Oh, I apologize to those people. Now vote for Alan to become president. <laughs> it's not all lost. You voted for MPP because of me. But now MPP has disappointed all of us. So now bring your own person into power and then you will not be disappointed. But this leads us on to uh, the last comment on how are we going to break through this monopoly of the NDC and MPP? I want to use this opportunity to tell you that the majority of Ghanaians have, they, have made up their mind that they, want, they don't want either MPP or the NDC. I'm sure most of you are aware of that. The unfortunate thing is that many of them seem to be suggesting that maybe they will not vote at all. But that is also no good for our democracy. So what they are hoping is that Alan will say firmly that he's going to contest. That's all they are waiting for, because they've made it clear that they want a change. They are looking for an alternative. And they are hoping that Alan will make it clear. I'm making it clear today that Alan is going to contest to become the next president of the Republic of Ghana. And all the propaganda going around by some people within the MPP and those without saying that Alan is going to go back to the MPP has no basis and no foundation. What is the basis of that? I'm contesting as an independent candidate who is going to bring the first government of national unity into being. So what is this talk about? Oh, they are trying to convince him to go to uh, MPP. So let me clarify that once and for all. Alan is going to contest as a presidential candidate on his own merit. And I want this to be clarified. But to seal this matter, I've come from within MPP as a founding partner. I can tell you that MPP does not have more than one million committed registered voters. One million, they don't have it. All this talk about they have 47, 45, NDC has 45, they don't have any 45. They don't have it. The only reason why in the long run, when it comes to general election, they have either 6 million, 6.5, 6 million, is because the people of Ghana have no alternative. So when it comes to election, then they have to choose between one of them. That is how the numbers come up. But I can tell you that they don't have more than one million registered committed voters. All of them are waiting for the right alternative. And to validate what I'm saying, 
2020, there were 17 million registered voters. 10 million of the 17 were aged between 18 and 35. Hello? 10 million out of the 17 million people who were registered voters in 2020 are aged between 18 to 35. These are the group of people who have lost faith in our democracy because the NDC and the MPP have not delivered, de delivered any dividend to them. And these 10 million people, they are there. What would be the basis for them now to have confidence in either MPP or NDC? Does it make sense no. that after 32 years in power, these are 18 to 35. Some of them have finished school five years, they don't have a job. And meanwhile, the NDC and MPP have not been able to convince them that they can do anything different. So the 10 million people are waiting for Alan to make a declaration that he's actually going to stand. And I'm standing because of the young people of this country. I've made it clear. It is a youth-led movement. It is a youth-led movement. I've already committed to the fact that 60% of my appointments, not ministers, all appointments will be between whatever, 22 to 45 uh, years, or let's say 50 years. I've already made that commitment, and it's going to ha happen. My vice president will be a young person. Yeah. And it will be clear, because me, I'm only a transition candidate. You see, the wisdom, the wisdom and the capacity and the grace that God has given me to serve President Kufour and make him a celebrated president, that same wisdom and capacity and knowledge he has given me to make a difference in President Kufour's government is the same grace that the Lord is providing to me to be able to lead Ghana. And so, for me, you watch what is going to happen. Because people are going around confusing people. Alan, he's a fine gentleman. He's the right person. But they, won't, they will say that it's either NDC or NPP. It is not either NPP or NDC. It is not either NPP. Now the game is over. For the NPP and NDC. The game is over. The majority of the people know that there is nothing new that the NPP or NDC can offer. Right now, can you imagine that a new political organization, a new candidate contesting for president has come out with a substantive, not manifesto, a plan that we are discussing. Two parties that have been in power, they are now struggling with their manifestos. And frankly, a lot of the things that I've been hearing them say, it's all a repackaging of what is in the GTP. Many of the things they are talking about, just repackaging what the GTP has said. And I say these things in all modesty, but don't let them confuse you. The majority of the people who are going to select the next president, they've made a decision that it is not NDC, it is not MPP. And so, have faith and deliver Alan. Ghana will rise again. So thank you very much. And just also to thank you so profoundly. I'm so very much impressed. It's unfortunate that um, none of you made reference to some of the ideas in the GTP about, media, about the media. But I want to assure you, you know, there are three pillars of media work. First is to inform, educate, and then entertain. And the media can make or make this country just by the first pillar, just information. If you are able 
to disseminate and explain to the people of Ghana what the GTP offers, Ghana will rise again. Just from information, and whilst you inform, you are also educating. And when prosperity comes, then it's entertainment. So thank you very much. I really appreciate this. Thank you, sir. We'll take that as closing remarks. But two fundamental things have been said here, which will suffice for closing remarks. That the vice president is going to be young. Those people who told me that they are going to dye their hair, do affidavit. Be careful. <laughs> the affidavit people, be careful. Because we will vet you. So on that note, we are very grateful. It's been a fantastic time. I believe I speak for all of us when I say it's been very, very interesting, very useful, very interactive. Now, there's a cocktail served downstairs by the pool. Please help yourself. I have a very few copies of the GTP. So if you can prove to me that you didn't have a copy as a journalist and that your grandmother can vouch for you tonight, I'll let you have a copy. Because I want strict proof. That's why I'm asking for your grandmother. So on that note, we'll have the closing prayer. Please, 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 you are a journalist. There's behavioral and mindset change. What are you doing? Wait for the closing prayer. <laughs> Allah Jibala. <laughs> Give us a closing prayer. Thank you. A quick reminder. On 31st of this month, please, you are all invited um, at the Akuman for Ado, I mean to adore the Zumunta for Alan. Zongo. Zongo Zumunta for Alan. That's a ring um, to the great transformation. Thank you. Let's pray, please. In your Sorkum Law for La Galabun Lacum Lahua, or Law Galabun Alam Ri, or Lakitan and Sansla Alamun, Allah La Ila Ila, or Hail Kayumula, thousands of Natal and Nomolo, Mafisa Mato Mafla Ad, Manzal Lazi, as for in the will be easily along my Ben ID, who mal for a lie to Nabisha, Billy Mila Masha, Wasia, Kusu Samawat, or Adwala, you do Zoom our Alula Zim. Amen. We may meet by the poolside.